Komið þið sæl, ég heiti Ingveldur Jónsdóttur og verð fundarstjóri hér í dag og mig langar að byrja á því að bjóða ykkur velkomin á þetta málþing Öryrkja Bandalags Íslands um viðvegandi aðlögun á vinnumarkaði og starfsgetum að. En fyrst ætlar að tala Ellen Kalmon, formaður ÖBI. Velkomin Ellen upp á svið. Já, þetta er. Welcome, Sail. Very welcome. I especially want to welcome Professor Anna Lawson. Um, uh, Anna Lawson, she is a professor of law and director of the Center for Disability Studies at the University of Leeds. Uh, she has, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, she is also the director of the university-wide interdisciplinary center for disability studies and has played ro lead roles in a range of interdisciplinary national and multinational research projects. Um, she has, um, yeah, <laughs> I was just reading uh, your CV, Anna, and uh, I saw that you were also uh, been working for the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights and the European Commission. Um, today, Anna will be talking about uh, reasonable accommodation in the work market and workability assessment. And we have, of, of course, been working with the UNCRPD here in Iceland. And reasonable accommodation is a very important uh, um, uh, yeah, a part of the CRPD and something that we have been fighting for for quite a long time in Iceland. But that means, um, a reasonable accommodation means necessary and appropriate modification and adjustments, not imposing um, disproportionate or undue burden were needed in a particular case to ensure to persons with disabilities the enjoyment or exercise on an equal basis with others of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. I again warmly want to welcome Anna. Uh, thank you for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> right. So thank you again for the invitation and sorry about the wires and the noise. Um, I'm listening to some very brief notes I've made for myself through my headphone and I realised it wasn't there. Uh, okay. So, I am talking to you today about reasonable accommodation and also about work capacity assessments and um, the linkage between the two. Um, I've divided the talk into six parts. Um, so to begin with, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context and set the scene. And then second, just to think about how the problem would be approached if we used, uh, if, we, if we looked at it through the lenses of either the individual model of disability or the social model of disability. And then third and fourth both concern um, rights. So the third section would be looking at rights to social protection, which is where um, the work capacity assessment is part of a, an overall social protection scheme. So thinking about how work capacity assessments fit in the context of human rights and social protection. And then fourth would be a particular focus on rights to reasonable accommodation in the workplace. And then the fifth and final of the main sections would be thinking beyond reasonable accommodation about how employers and workplaces could help to fit the labour market for disabled people again, in the context of human rights law. 
and then I'll conclude with some final remarks. So turning to the first of those sections then, um, the context. What is the problem really that we're looking at? Because it sounds a bit complicated from that structure I've just given you. <coughs> so um, there should be a picture of a nice tree, um, like a type of big tree that we have many of in Yorkshire, but I understand less in Iceland. And I've used this image to capture the idea of the labour market and also the idea of particular workplaces and organisations which employ people. So it's a large entity with many different branches, many different types of function. And it needs many different types of people to work in it. So it will need wise people, people who are calm, able to reflect, have a long term perspective. Like the owl. It will also need people who are very conscious of image, people who are good at presenting an image of the organisation, good at um, PR, good at publicity, um, good at thinking about what the opposition are doing. So we have the cat. It will need people who are curious, inquisitive, maybe have a tendency to keep things, organise things. Um, squirrels of this world. <laughs> and it will also need loyal, clever, um, hardworking, flexible people. Have we got the picture, David? Oh. <laughs> so I could give this particular one a reference myself because he's my guide dog. Um, and any organisation would benefit from people working there with qualities of the type that he has. But if the organisation or the labour market has a particular shape, like a tree, it's going to exclude people who have these qualities if they can't fit into that particular shape. Um, dogs can't climb trees. Um, many disabled people struggle to get into particular types of organisation to work or to get into the, labor, the open labour market to work because of the way it's organised. That might be the way it's physically organised, the way uh, there might be barriers um, in terms of physical design to getting into the building or getting around the building um, or around the, the places where employees need to go. It might be a problem in access to information. The computing systems may not be accessible. The intranet may not be accessible to blind people. There may be an emphasis on communications, which depend on oral interactions and um, which aren't easily adapted or, or have not traditionally been adapted to allow for communication through sign language or other mechanisms. Or it might be because of the rules and systems and practices that operate within the organisation, like starting strictly at nine o'clock, which makes it difficult sometimes for people with psychosocial disabilities to get there on time. Maybe because of stress due to travel in <coughs> rush hour or due to the impact of medication they need to take in the mornings. So... The problem is that we have a workplace, we have an open labour market, which isn't always very open to people who don't fit standard expectations of, of human beings. That's wasteful for the labour market because it excludes talented people. It's also incredibly... Um, Problematic for the individuals who are excluded because it's strongly linked to poverty and to social isolation. So that's, that's the problem, that's the context that we're looking at. Um, in Iceland, I understand that there are 
particular debates at the moment around this whole idea of work capacity assessments um, and that there have been attempts to introduce discrimination legislation quite recently but I'm not an expert in the Icelandic situation and I'm really looking forward to hearing more soon. I'm going to draw on some experiences from the UK in both regards and also, as I mentioned at the beginning, set this discussion within the broader international context, both at European level and also at the, particularly at, within developments happening at UN level. So moving on to the second section then, what happens if we view this problem of exclusion from the labour market and what happens to those people who are excluded, the disabled people who are excluded because they don't fit into the current system? What happens if we view that problem through the individual model of disability lens and if we view it through the social model of disability lens? And I'm not going to explain in detail what these models are. I'm sure you're familiar with these ideas, at least um, at the very simple level, which I think is often the most effective level for, for thinking about problems from different viewpoints. So if we think about it from the individual model perspective, the focus there would be on finding a solution which focuses through methods which focus on the individual concerned. So we might try and change people through medical advances, which can be extremely helpful. Um, but we might try and change the individual to, to, through, through medicine, through technology, so that they can climb the tree so that they can get into the current system. If they can't, despite our best efforts, then they will remain segregated because the system doesn't change. They'll remain excluded. And um, consequently, poverty is a very high risk because they won't be able to earn a living through work. Um, and the result is a reliance on charity or a reliance on welfare benefits, social protection, if they're to have an adequate standard of living. If we view the problem from the social model perspective, then the focus is on finding a solution which involves changing the structures of society. So changing the way that workplaces are structured and organised, changing the, the physical rules, the, the practices, um, the information systems to make them more inclusive, more accessible. And to conclude this section on the individual and social model approaches, I just want to play you a very short film. I think it's, is it about three minutes long, David? About three minutes long um, from Business Disability International. Imagine if everyone in your life who has a disability suddenly just disappeared. Oops, there go the 10% dyslexic, the 13% hearing impaired, the 10% with sight loss, diabetes, arthritis, learning disabilities, depression, facial disfigurement, dementia and stroke, asthma, speech impairment, wheelchair users, autism, multiple sclerosis, migraines, anxiety, sickle cell, syndrome, amputation, Parkinson's, brain damage, pain, palsy, anxiety, epilepsy, Tourette's. muscular dystrophy. Before we know it, there'd be no one left. There are more than one billion people with disabilities worldwide and the number is growing. Yet how many of us, when we hear this word, disability, automatically click to the old assumptions. Nothing to do with me, it's just a few wheelchair users, blind people, dogs. Doctors and charities take care of them. When actually the experience of disability, the unfairness and disadvantage that it brings, is very much about me. In fact, about all of us. About our experience as we go through life, and about getting older, which most of us would like to do.
Actually, we all know human perfection is rare. Why bother with the Olympics if everyone can do a three-minute mile? The real problem is our sad tendency to make assumptions about each other on the basis of labels. How we ourselves expect to be treated is changing as we recognize that we all have a basic right to respect, dignity, and choice. We need to replace the unacceptable old focus on medical labels with the new focus on individual potential, dignity, and human rights. The old brain makes assumptions. Everyone just knows that blind people can't use the internet. The new brain asks, how could this talented blind researcher do this job if we were clever? Simply put, impairment is what happens to you, disability is what we do to you. Refuse the ramp, refuse flexi time, insist you apply online even though the technology won't let you. Refuse to let you use a different keyboard. Assume you are just not worth the bother. That old click comes through especially loud and clear when you hear the traditional challenge. So what is the business case for hiring disabled people? But just think, nobody asks, what is the business case for hiring, say, Canadians? Everyone knows some can do the job, some can't, some have the talent, some don't, some need adjustments, some do not. We don't generalize about 35 million people labeled Canadians. Why on earth do we still generalize about more than 1 billion people labeled disabled? And yes, I am Canadian. And listen hard to the disabled graduate's new brain reaction. Why do you need a business case for treating me properly? Business Disability International wants to start a brand new conversation which drives a global revolution as disabled and not yet disabled, come together to ask, how do we replace the old brain with the new? And in case you're wondering who this Canadian is, I'm Susan Scott Parker, Chief Executive of Business Disability International. Okay, so moving on then to the third section, and now we're really getting onto the hardcore human rights context. Um, and I'm particularly going to be situating this discussion within the context of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which Iceland has ratified, as has the EU and the UK. So um, the first of these types of rights we're going to look at and think about a little bit is the right which is set out in Article 28 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD. And that's the right to social protection and to an adequate standard of living. And the first thing, before we get into anything to do with what Article 28 says, I um, want to just reflect a minute on some challenges. And these are challenges about the work or concerning work capacity assessments, which are an incredibly common feature of social protection systems around the world. Um, but what challenges are there in the way these, these capacity assessments operate? First of all, what challenges are there in the formulation of these types of tests? They're phrased as eligibility tests to um, access certain types of benefit, but they may also operate as eligi eligibility assessments to get certain types of jobs. Um, one challenge is getting the eligibility tests right so that they don't exclude too many people um, and they give benefits to the people who need it. And I will argue for reasons that I'll come on to in a minute, but that's virtually an impossible task to get right if you're using work capacity assessments, for reasons I'll explain shortly. In the UK, um, we have movements, particularly disabled people's Disabled People Against the Cuts and the Black Triangle Movement, um, which have been started since 2010, specifically in response to shifts in the eligibility criteria for work capacity assessments and some other benefits, which have made it harder 
to, to get access to those benefits, which have meant that many disabled people no longer have access to them. And as a, as a result, their standard of living has fallen below what most people, including the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability, would regard as adequate. There was a report published earlier on this year by Oxford researchers in Oxford, which suggested that cuts because of austerity in the health and social care sector were the main reason for 30,000 excess deaths in 2015. So getting the eligibility level is right, is difficult, and it can be manipulated for political reasons um, to make it low. And that's, to some extent, a problem with all benefits, but there are particular problems with work capacity assessments. Um, another problem is ensuring that um, the tests are set fairly for people with different types of impairment. And a problem we've had in the UK is that people with mental health conditions in particular and other people with um, more intermittent types of health condition have found that the, the, the work capacity assessments don't work well for them. Um, and also, well, I'll come on to the process in a second. So, yeah, operating fairly across all impairment types. Um, and that, again, is something to some extent that's shared with other types of um, benefit assessments. In relation to work capacity in particular, a problem is um, the link between the way they operate and the perception of disabled people as being lazy, work shy benefit sheets, which has also been linked to an increase in hate crime against disabled people. Um, in the UK, that may not have happened in Iceland. Um, and there's also, even if that doesn't happen, these work capacity assessments, this, this type of system operates to reinforce stereotypes that disabled people, because you have an impairment, you can't work. Your capacity to work is going to be limited because you have an impairment. And I think that video from Susan Scott Parker illustrates that that's not a, that's not a fair assumption to make in this day and age. Our ability to work is not defined purely by our impairment, it's defined by the way the workplace is structured and organised. But work capacity assessments, by their nature, reinforce that stereotype about disabled people. It makes it also difficult to argue that you are capable of work um, with an employer or perhaps with a court if you do want to bring a discrimination claim when the employer has tried to sack you or not give you a job because of the assumption that you can't work. If you've previously claimed benefits which are given to you on the basis that you can't work, it makes it very difficult for you then to have an argument with an employer or with with them in court um, when you're trying to say I can work and the right thing to do was that the employer should have given me that job and it's unfair discrimination of them not to have done so. They can also, with these work capacity assessments can also lead to benefit traps and the way this happens is very well explained in a report by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which I'll come to later. Um, and she argues, this is Catalina Devander in 2015, she argues that these work capacity assessments tend to bundle two things together. They bundle the extra costs associated with disability, with living as a disabled people, person in an inaccessible world or in a world which simply has extra costs because you need personal assistance or needs to for transport which cost more money or um, needs for extra health care which costs money so there are these extra costs of living as a disabled person 
And there are also costs of being out of work, which are the need for income, basic, a basic level of income. And work capacity assessments or work capacity benefits tend to bundle those two things together. So the result is if you don't, if you're judged to be capable of work, so if you pass the work capacity assessment, you lose the extra benefits, which are actually intended to cover the extra costs of living as a disabled person. And that means that for a lot of people, unless they can get a very well-paid job, they're going to be better off out of work than in work. So it creates a benefit trap, <coughs> a disincentive for disabled people applying for jobs. There are also challenges around the process of these work capacity assessments, and to some extent, these are shared by other types of um, benefit assessment. And we have a lot of experience of these challenges in the UK over the last few years. And if you're interested in learning more, a quick way is to look at the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, concluding observations on the UK, which were issued in September this year which are available on, on the UN Committee's website. Um, in the UK, the process has been administered through private companies, so it's been privatised, um, and perhaps with, without adequate monitoring of what these private companies, who, who are often profit-based companies, um, how they administer the tests. There are often limited rights to appeal, there are often demands for repeat assessments, even when people have conditions which are clearly going to be lifelong. And the process of administering in the UK has often not been accessible um, to disabled people themselves. So there's been a reluctance to provide information, for instance, to blind applicants in formats they can read. Um, so the system needs to be administered in a way that's inclusive and non-discriminatory and accessible. And that whole process can be expensive, particularly if it relies on a lot of recurrent um, assessments, which can be incredibly stressful for the people being assessed, as well as time-consuming and expensive for the system. So how do we move from from these problems to um, a rights-based disability inclusive approach that's in line with Article 28 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That was the subject of Catalina de Vanda's um, 2015 report to the UN General Assembly. So she's the person I mentioned before, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and it's really well worth having a look at that 2015 report of hers. She argues very strongly in that report for universalising social protection systems so that disability isn't treated as a separate, segregated, hived-off issue. It's integrated into the mainstream social protection system but that that system also includes a way of covering the extra costs of living as a disabled person in a meaningful way, so that it includes um, a mechanism for covering the extra disability-related costs, but doesn't link those into a work capacity test, so that you, you get those perhaps regardless of whether you've got a job or not, and actually that is the system we have in the UK. So we have the personal independence payment, um, which used to be the disability living allowance. And the idea of that is that it's not means tested. It's available to all disabled people of working age um, to cover the extra costs of living as a disabled person. It's not dependent on being out of work. Um, so she argues that that should, should not be linked to work capacity assessments um, and that it should be available either um, as to all disabled people 
or at least to all disabled people until they get to a substantial level of income from a job. So it would cover people who are in work if their level of income is not very great. In an ideal world, it should cover everybody um, who is disabled if, if those costs apply to them. And then alongside that, there needs to be um, income support mechanisms, which include out of work benefits, so that people who are out of work, whether they're disabled or not, can be assured of an adequate standard of living. So her report draws attention in very strong terms to the, to the problems of work capacity assessments and the link that they make between the bundling of these two forms of benefit <coughs> and the dangers they create of stere continuing the stereotypes of disabled people as not being able to work simply because they have an impairment. Moving on to the fourth section then, the different type of rights. Oh, and, and I just would like to add there that her report is very much in line with the guidance which is also coming out of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, including the quite detailed recommendations which were made on that to the UK in August this year, August, September this year. So moving on then to Section four, um, rights to reasonable accommodation, particularly in work. Um, so the first question here is, what is reasonable accommodation? And this, I'm very grateful to, um, was it Ellen who, in, no, who introduced me? Sorry, I can't remember the name. The person who introduced me, the brilliant introduction, because um, she very kindly read out Article two of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is the definition article, um, the, the part that relates to reasonable accommodation. And I'd like to pick out three particular elements from that definition, which isn't the easiest of definitions to understand on first reading. Um, so the first thing I want to pick out um, is that it, it, it means a form of modification or adjustment. So a reasonable accommodation is a form of modification or adjustment. So in the workplace, that would mean the employer making an adjustment. That might be a physical adjustment, so putting a ramp in instead of steps, making a desk of adjustable height, um, providing a screen reader for a blind person, it might mean things, and most reasonable adjustments at work don't involve very much cost. So it might mean allowing somebody to start work an hour later and leave an hour later. It might mean um, allowing them to sit in a particular place because the lighting suits them better. Being flexible, um, and that doesn't necessarily involve a cost. It might involve a cost, but it doesn't necessarily the second point to pick out is that it refers to the particular case, and that means the particular individual in the particular context in which they're trying to find a job or maintain a job. And for that reason, it's really important for employers to have a, a dialogue with that particular person to find out what suits them, what they think would help solve the problem that is created by the standard way of operating that the employer has. So, for instance, if um, an employer like my employer, the standard way of operating in meetings is to give everybody um, an agenda in print and various papers in print. Um, if the employer doesn't talk to me, they might give me everything in Braille and that wouldn't help me any more than having them in print, really. Um, they would need to know that I'm not a very good Braille reader and I need things electronically if I'm to be able to access them. So having a dialogue, finding out what suits that particular person to solve the problem is really important. And it's part of what reasonableness means. Um, and the third element is that it's subject to this notion of undue or disproportionate burden. So the notion of reasonable accommodation 
carries with it a safeguard for employers. They don't have to do what would be unreasonable. They don't have to, to go beyond reasonableness to take steps or um, incur costs that would impose an undue burden on them. So, moving on to the next question um, or issue, which is reasonable accommodation, the state and employers. So how does the state figure, feature in this relationship of reasonable accommodation and employment? The state, of course, might be the employer, but they may not. It might be private employers. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities requires, as part of the, dis the, the prohibition of discrimination, it requires all employers to um, provide reasonable accommodation to disabled employees. And failure to do that will amount to discrimination. So that's required by Article 5 and also Article 27 of the CRPD. Discrimination or the, the, the obligation under the, the CRPD to prohibit discrimination is, it has immediate effect. It's not something that states are able to wait and um, do nothing about. It's an obligation that has immediate effect because in theory, it's an obligation of restraint. It's an obligation to stop something happening rather than an obligation to invest a lot in changing your systems. Reasonable accommodation is part of that and that's why it's limited by this notion of undue or disproportionate burden. It's something that has immediate effect. It should be happening immediately. Um, also, so the state has an obligation to, to make sure that employers prohibit, to, to prohibit employers from discriminating, to, to introduce legislation to stop employers discriminating and make it unlawful for employers to discriminate and allow disabled people to challenge that discrimination. Also, under Article 5, Paragraph 3, the state has a specific obligation to facilitate reasonable obligations reasonable accommodation, to promote reasonable accommodation. And that it might do by um, providing information, codes of practice about what it means, about what undue or disproportionate burden mean, about in making sure that disabled people know that they can ask for it. They don't have to just fit in with the existing workplace structures. Another way the state can make a big difference to the effectiveness of what can be achieved through reasonable accommodation is to combine um, its policies on employment with its policies on social protection. So to invest money in making reasonable accommodations go further and take some of the burden of paying for reasonable accommodations away from employers. And that's something which in the UK has been a tremendous success, our access to work scheme. Um, so this operates in a very personalised way um, so that each disabled person who applies for a job or even wants to become self-employed can apply for access to work funding. That doesn't remove the need for employers to make reasonable adjustments but it means that what that, that um, the needs of the person can be met even if they would cost more than the employer can afford because the state adds to um, the budget and pays for that expense. So, for instance, I have a personal assistant who works with me for three days a week um, to scan materials, to help me find new places I have to go to, to read things I can't read because they're in handwriting, to access inaccessible databases, all that kind of thing. Um, the employer contributes some money towards that, but the vast majority of that money is funded through the Access to Work scheme by the government. Without that, I very much doubt whether I would have um, been able to get the job in the first place. I certainly would have found it extremely stressful and 
I'm sure wouldn't have stayed in it as long as I have and certainly wouldn't have been promoted. So using social protection monies creatively to, to make the impact of reasonable adjustment go further in a very personalised way so that it's following the individual needs is, is, is a really effective use of public monies. There was a report in 2012 by Liz Sace, who has just retired as chair of the Disability Rights UK organisation. And that found that for every pound that our government spent on the access to work scheme, it got 50 pence, it got £1.50 back. Um, when you looked at things like increasing the employment rates for people who are working as personal assistants, um, increasing the employment rates of disabled people, the money they got through tax revenues and the money they saved in unemployment benefits. So it's a good investment. The problems we've had with it in the UK are around implementation, around people knowing about it and claiming it and about um, making sure that it gets to people quickly enough. And these problems are replicated at the European level. The European Disability Forum has drawn attention to problems around um, people being aware of their rights to ask for reasonable accommodation and their rights to accompanying benefits that the state might use to supplement it with. Um, and the case of Jungelin versus Sweden um, is a case that was heard by the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities a few years ago, two years ago, I think it was. Um, do people know this case? Jungelin versus Sweden. No. So it concerned a blind woman who applied for a job in the Swedish um, Social Protection Agency. She was refused because the internet system wasn't accessible to her. She was a, a, a screen reader. She used um, a screen reading software. And the internet system wasn't accessible to her computing software. And they said it would be too expensive to hire somebody to work with her um, and adjustments couldn't be made that would allow her to do the job she'd applied for um, using that system. And it would be too expensive for them to replace their system, their software, with an accessible version. The committee, the UN committee, found it, it's the only decision where there's been a divide, a divided view in the members of that committee. But the majority found um, that Sweden, the Swedish courts, um, had been, they couldn't overturn the decision of the Swedish courts to approve um, the decision of the employer to reject her on the grounds that it was an undue burden because the committee found that it was assessments of what was undue must be mostly for the country concerned. Um, so I think there are problems around this in that the minority view is favoured by, well, I favour the minority view, as does the um, Office for the Human Rights Commissioner, the, the Office of the Commissioner of Human Rights. Um, and that's that the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities should provide guidance to countries about how to understand undue or disproportionate burden. Um, but that's something I think we're likely to get when the committee writes its general comment on Article 5 next year. So we're likely to get a lot more guidance on what, from the committee on what reasonable accommodation means for the purposes of the CRPD next year. Um, but the Jungelin case is useful because it shows the problems of inaccessibility. So if a company chooses to buy inaccessible software, it makes it quite difficult for them to employ blind disabled people, sorry, blind people later on because of the difficulties of making individual adjustments 
when you have an inaccessible system. If they bought accessible software in the first place, it would have been very easy for that woman to be employed and given a job. So reasonable accommodation has its limits, and I think we need to think beyond that. So moving to section five, moving beyond reasonable accommodation to think about how employers can fit their workplaces for disabled people, going beyond reasonable accommodation, which is incredibly important, but does have this inbuilt limit of undue or disproportionate burden. First of all, accessibility. And this also is a right under the CRPD, under Article 9. The state can help with this by developing accessibility standards and making them binding. For instance, it could link accessibility standards to the procurement process and require public sector bodies to ensure that all new equipment, new buildings, have to be compliant with accessibility standards. It could also be achieved through um, the way discrimination law is framed, so making it possible to challenge lack of accessibility, not just through reasonable accommodation provisions, but also through indirect discrimination, or through concepts like we have in the UK of anticipatory reasonable adjustments although ours doesn't apply to employment, sadly. Second, tackling prejudice and changing attitudes. So the work capacity assessments, as the UN Special Rapporteur has pointed out, can actually entrench the wrong attitudes, can, do actually tend to entrench stereotypes about lack of capacity, lack of ability of disabled people to work. So having benefit systems which don't do that would be an improvement. So too would um, training, building training for teachers, training for human resources people, um, training for disabled people's organisations in what reasonable accommodation means and also in the importance of accessibility and inclusion. Leave and flexibility. So policies around disability leave. This is particularly important for people who become disabled while they're at work. A lot of people who become disabled or have lo acquire long-term illnesses when they've got jobs end up falling out of the employment market and then never getting back in again. Whereas if there was a system of disability leave, they may be able to take perhaps a year out to give them time to adjust to their new circumstances, learn new techniques for working, discuss with their employer perhaps changes that could be made to the job they're doing within the same organisation so that they don't end up becoming unemployed or on that list of people regarded as incapable. Um, Flexible work policies, so policies, and these don't need to be confined to disabled people, policies which allow flexible work um, patterns. And then um, self-employment and cooperatives. So government can be very helpful in um, supporting disabled people who want to become self-employed, who want to start their own businesses or who want to work together to form cooperatives. Concluding thoughts. <laughs> so we've, had a, we've covered a lot. The, this area, I'm afraid, is a big one, but one that can't be considered in isolation. It needs to be considered as part of that complex interlocking human rights package. Just to pull it together, there are three particular things that I think need to come out of this. First of all, um, the need to make social protection 
schemes universal and disability inclusive, in line with the type of guidance provided by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And that does avoid, avoid the use of work capacity assessments. Second, requiring um, employers to become more inclusive. So introducing schemes, policies, which will oblige employers and encourage employers to be more inclusive of disabled people. And that will involve changing the way that things operate within the employment structure. Third, um, being creative about combining reasonable accommodation duties, which are part of the non-discrimination obligation, with funding from the state. Only if those three things are done together, I think, can we really start tackling in a holistic way the problems that we have, perhaps in Iceland, certainly in the UK, and in, I think, nearly all countries across the globe at the moment, of the unnecessary exclusion of talented disabled people from the workplace. Thank you very much.